Okay, we're back. The era, 1870s, 1880s, 1890s, is, as we said, the Gilded Age. It's covered in gold. What do you think that means? What do you think that, again, Mark Twain was originating the term. So that during the Gilded Age, there's going to be a lot of things happening in the country. Population is going to double. The United States is going to be one of the richest countries in the world. In the world. We're going to have massive immigration. Big businesses will make a ton of money. There was also no income tax at the time. There generally was, in the Gilded Age, a lot of corruption. So let's take a look. This image, let me turn off the light, uh, is of the U.S. Senate during the Gilded Age. The senators are the little people sitting in their little Senate seats, and these are the people who run everything, who control them. The big fat hats, the steel beam trust, the copper trust, all these different trusts, monopolies, that whatever the heck they wanted. In the Gilded Age, all that mattered was making money, like Boss Tweed did in New York City. So let's take a look at Boss Tweed. William Marcy Tweed ran something called Tammany Hall, which was the democratic control of New York City. Technically, Tammany Hall still exists today. It's a building. It's where the Democratic Party was based. It's not to say that the only corruption that was done during this Gilded Age era, and again, the Gilded Age, roughly 1870 through 1900 or so, because it's an era. But during that time, whatever idealism you had about fighting the Civil War to free people and end a horrible war and build this great country, during the Gilded Age, the reality is it's about getting ahead, becoming successful, making money, even if you're corrupt, it's not so bad because lots of people are corrupt. That's what the view is. So, Boss Tweed was, again, this is a pub cartoonist, basically, named Nast, who made a cartoon of the guy who ran New York City and essentially stole tens of millions of dollars. You'd work all day for $1.50. The guy stole like $200, $200 million. So, the reality is, in the Gilded Age, honesty and idealism and moral authority don't mean anything. Also in the Gilded Age, the Congress, House and Senate, is very equally balanced. There are about as many Democrats as Republicans. The difference is the Democrats are hurt by the fact that they lost the Civil War. A Democrat killed Abraham Lincoln. Lincoln was a Republican. And when all heck breaks loose, you could always basically trust people that they would essentially blame the Confederacy for everything. During the Gilded Age, also, there's another organization. It's called the Grand Army of the Republic. It is a veterans organization. Let me make sure it's still recording. It's a veterans organization that is made up of former Union soldiers. Most of them Republican. The Grand Army is a veterans organization. And the vets want the government to give them big fat pensions. I suffered a terrible injury in the Civil War. I need money for the rest of my life. Well, you broke your leg after the Civil War. You didn't suffer actually from the war. But the reality is, in the Gilded Age, there's a lot of corruption. And the reality is basically people wanted to be taken care of financially from the federal government whether it's the government giving money to railroad companies so that they build the railroads that they want so much, whatever. The Gilded Age is known for its massive corruption. It looks uh, amazing on the exterior. America's becoming going to become one of the richest countries in the world, but underneath, there's terrible poverty, there's corruption, there's racism, there's Jim Crow, there's everything bad. And not all of it is good. And again, you can't talk about the Gilded Age without talking about corruption. But remember what I said? <coughs> The Democrats and Republicans had about equal power in the Congress. The presidency was mostly run by the Republicans. But Congress was generally run by Democrats increasingly. Not always, but generally. There are certain issues in the Gilded Age. One of them is these veterans. They are northern veterans who won the Civil War, and they want the government to give them money. Another thing, which doesn't sound so important, believe me when I tell you, 
a madman is going to kill the president over it is this. Civil service reform. And what that is, the civil service is like the post office. Should you get a government job because you know someone? Now you may be thinking about the fact that Andrew ja Jackson, not Johnson, but Andrew Jackson back in the 1820s, fired a lot of the people that had supported his opponent, who was uh, John Quincy Adams. The spoil system essentially is, I won the election, I'm going to fire all my opponents, people, in the government jobs, and I'll put my own people in there. What's the problem with, it's called patronage. So civil service reform is versus patronage. Like I am the guy who won the election, and I'm going to fire my opponents, guys that are in the government, and appoint my own. Jack Jackson. Uh, was a big believer in that, and there were Republicans who also believed in that too, including one guy, uh, Marshall Conklin from, the, uh, from New York State. We'll talk about him later. Should they base it more on, as you can see here, a merit system? Meaning we should hire people because they actually can read and write, they're not criminals, they actually can do a good job, or do you want to keep it where politicians just reward people uh, with jobs when they basically get elected and I fire my opponent's people and I put my own guys there at the post office and everything, job, jobs like that. The question is, and this doesn't, sound like, this doesn't sound like a really serious issue, but a madman will shoot the president and kill the president over this. What if we, as James Garfield, also a union general from Ohio, will become president after Rutherford or Rutherford B. Hayes leaves in 1880? James Garfield was at least open to the idea that maybe we should have some kind of civil service reform. So let's take a look. If you wanted civil service reform, your civil service, if you supported civil service reform, meaning that you should get the job because like you can read and write and do basic math, and that like we actually need you because you're good at your job. Half breeds. generally support civil service reform. The opponents, and there are a lot of them, are the stalwarts. To be stalwart is meaning to be a hardcore supporter of something and basically defend it. Stalwarts don't look at the patronage system as really corrupt. They say, Ali, that this is the cost of democracy in America. How else will people actually support me if I couldn't give them jobs? Boss Tweed did give out a lot of jobs to Democrat friends of his. They stole tons of money at the same time. But the bottom line is, this man, James Garfield, is at least, he's a Republican, Ohio. He'll win the presidency in 1880. He was at least open to the idea that he's something of a half-breed, that maybe we should get qualified people to do these jobs. So like, can you read and write? And if you can't read and write, if you have a criminal record because you steal stuff, you probably shouldn't be delivering the mail. If you can't read and write, how do you even read what the envelope is to basically give it to the right person the person is? A crazy man who was a stalwart decided, I should get a government job. I want to be an ambassador to like France. And he said, James Garfield, but one of the things that's going to sound sort of ridiculous, but presidents used to spend a lot of their personal time and working professional time giving out jobs to people who support A crazy man named Charles Couteau, name lost to history, decided, I want to be an ambassador, and Garfield should make me an ambassador. I am a Republican, and he's a Republican, and he owes me a job. Okay, that's one thing. I'll show you the guy. James Garfield had a vice president that you probably never heard much about. His name was Chester A. Arthur. Chester A. Arthur was a hardcore stalwart. He does not, he, he will become president when Garfield's assassinated. But Chester Arthur, his biggest supporter is the New York Senator Republican who likes the civil service just the way it is, nice and corrupt, without any reform, without any kind of test or any merit system. Roscoe Conklin is essentially the creator, not the creator, but a supporter of the stalwarts. 
no civil service reform. I get elected, I give out jobs, that's America. That's the way it is. Chester A. Arthur is a guy who really only had government jobs, but he wasn't a politician. What's significant, let's go back to this, Chester A. Arthur put this Arthur guy in the ticket to sort of heal the wounds of the Hebrews and the stalwarts, which is basically Republicans beating each other up. Chester A. Arthur had been the, port, the commissioner for the Port of New York. Two-thirds of the revenue that the government got at that time came from the Port of New York, which is one of the busiest ports in the world. He was the tariff commissioner. It was a great Republican job. And Roscoe Conklin, that, Ohio, that uh, New York stalwart senator, gave him the job. And the reality is, the previous president, guy by the brother Frog behaves, brother behaves, hired, fired him to make an example of him because he's not really corrupt, but Chester Arthur liked the idea of living well. And he actually made a lot more money legally than the president did because he was the port commissioner, which is a federal job for the Port of New York. Every ship that came in carrying shoes, hammers, whatever stoves you could possibly think of, had to actually pay a tariff on foreign products. You're seeing that right now with China, right? So he was fired by the previous president, Hayes. So the idea was, we're going to basically make some kind of like clean this up somehow. Should there be like a test? Should there not be a test? Should there be something? What's significant is Chester A. Arthur is going to assume the presidency about 81 days after Garfield was shot by a crazy person in Washington, D.C. Actually, dies in Elberon, New Jersey, which is along the Jersey Shore. There's a hello there. So here's the deal. The guy who shot him said, ha, as he said, as he's pulling the trigger in the train station, I just shot the president. I'm a stalwart and ha, 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 ha. Arthur's going to be president now, and Arthur will give me that job that I wanted to be an ambassador. He's completely bonkers, right? The reality is, Chester Arthur, people are going to blame him because the guy said who shot Garfield. And Garfield died about 81 days after being shot. He died of a blood infection because they were obsessed with getting the bullet. It was in his spinal column. Extremely painful. Garfield died. Rutherford B. Hayes, this plea was gone, I'm sorry, uh, Chester Arthur became president, and people were like, Chester Arthur, like, were you in a conspiracy to kill the president before? Because now you're the president. Believe it or not, this guy, Arthur, who had been a stalwart, he is a Republican from New York, he'd never really held elective office before, he had been, again, the tariff commissioner for the port of New York City. He, the job, shook him. Because some people blamed people like him and Roscoe Conklin, who had resigned his Senate seat in protest, by the way. Roscoe Conklin was the biggest supporter of Chester A. Arthur. Chester A. Arthur actually was like, after the president died, Garfield, maybe we should do something about civil service reform. Maybe we should, like, clean up the government, but government jobs. What that's going to be, and this is ironic, because he was a guy who benefited greatly from the patronage spoil system. He never held elective office before. Now he's the president. It was just like shocking. People like, Chet Arthur's the president? I'm like, are you kidding? Didn't the guy like, who shot the previous president say that it's great now that Arthur will be president? Arthur is going to do some really good stuff. One of the things he does in 1883 is the Pendleton Act. It starts out small, but it says that 10% of government jobs will be quote unquote classified and that you'll have to take a civil service exam. If you can't read or we don't need you for the job, if you can't read and write, you have a criminal record, you basically can't do basic, basic math, I guess if you can't type and other stuff like that, you're not going to get the government job. The Pendleton Act was really the response by people who said, 
the stalwarts had gone too far with civil service corruption, it was just massive corruption, it was all over the place. We should have uh, essentially honest government and that uh, we should basically, again, the Penalty Act is civil service reform. Here we go. This is the Penalty Act, the first one ever. It's going to take federal jobs and classify them as needing a test. So the old days of I got elected, I put my own friends in there and fired everybody for the opponent. Can't really happen quite the way it, it used to. Anymore. That being said, the number one thing in the Gilded Age is I want to make money. And if I cheat, rob, steal, whatever it is, just don't get caught. And the general sentiment was for people who lived the Gilded Age was everybody's corrupt, the corruption's not so bad, you know, it's just the way America is about. The Pendleton Act is about clean government. Today, about 50% of government jobs require civil service exam. You can't get a job working for the Defense Intelligence Agency, like my friend Mike, if you basically can't read and write, don't have a college degree, and that kind of stuff. That being said, the Pendleton Act still exists. We do require people. It's been updated, of course, over the last 140 years. But what's significant is that you, I can't give you a job anymore. I can't guarantee you a job like I used to, Ellie, because now you're going to take a civil service exam. Lots of jobs, basically. Most of, a lot of government jobs today require civil service exams. Postmen have to take a civil service exam. If you want to be a police officer, that's not a federal job, but a police officer, you're going to take a civil service exam. If you want to be an FBI agent, you're probably going to be a lawyer or know something about counterfeiting and basically uh, you know, want to basically uphold the law. That, that's going to be a civil service exam. We want to basically make that. The Pendleton Act, in other words, is looking at the idea of giving people jobs on merit, whether they deserve them or not, whether you can actually do the job, and we have a vacancy. So Chester Arthur did a pretty good job with that. It's ironic because he'd been a benefactor of the whole corruption system for decades. I mean, he himself was not personally corrupt, but he did make a lot more money than the president did because the port commissioner did make a bigger salary than the president did, which is ironic because the port commissioner of the port of New York is a federal employee. And you'd think you shouldn't make more money than the president, but Arthur did. That's true. Arthur didn't live much, he, wouldn't, he didn't run in 1884. Uh, he wouldn't live much longer anyway because he had basically a kidney ailment called Bright's disease. What's significant, people thought, you know, maybe we should try to clean up the government a bit. So I'm gonna pause this here again. And then I'm gonna basically update the board There's a scandal called Credit Mobilier. Let me explain. The government gave large amounts of land for free. For free. And they also gave subsidies, free cash, to railroad companies to lay railroad track so we get the darn railroad from the East Coast to the West Coast, truly connect the country across the center of America, right? That's the transcontinental railroad. Because it goes all the way to the East Coast, everywhere else here. What if I told you that the government did authorize giving money to companies, one of them was called Credit Mobilier, which is a railroad construction company. They lay track, they lay, make bridges and tunnels and the rest of it. Credit Mobilier, if I remember correctly, had supervised this portion in blue, which is the Union Pacific Railroad's construction of the railroad heading towards Utah. The other part was the Central Pacific Railroad, which went from San Francisco and Sacramento to Utah, so they'd meet in the middle. It wasn't exactly the middle, but you get the idea. Credit Mobilier is a railroad construction company. They said, well, Union Pacific Railroad, you're the ones we're building this for. Uh, it's so expensive building this track, they gave a big fat bill to the Union Pacific, which is a railroad company. Credit Mobilier is a railroad construction company that's laying track for the Union Pacific. What happened? Well, from California, East Coast. What if I told you that the bill that Credit Mobilier gave the Union Pacific was for like ridiculous amounts more money than it should have been? For example, say it costs $10 million to, to, to lay railroad track between point A and point B. What if, just what, if the bill ended up like $40 million? 
And then Union Pacific's like, wow, Congress, can you help us out with this gigantic thing? Now, Congress is going to give away millions of acres of free land to Union Pacific and other railroad companies to build the railroad track. We don't live in a communist society. The government doesn't real build railroad track private companies. But there's a problem. You see, the people who basically own the Union Pacific Railroad, which is the railroad company, and Credit Mobile Air, which is the railroad construction company, this is where it gets sort of corrupt. Sort of corrupt. They're the same people. Credit Mobile Air is overbilling themselves. The people who run Credit Mobile Air, the construction company for the railroad, and Union Pacific, which is the actual railroad company running the trains, are the same people. Surprising. Some people who were in Congress figured it out and said, hold on, they're, they're, they are getting millions of acres of free land to sell to people to become like farmers out west, and we are giving big fat subsidies from the Congress to pay for the railroad construction because it's so expensive because the government wants the railroad to be transcontinental. He's one of the guys that figured it out. And instead of blowing the cover and basically exposing all this wrongdoing, he had to be paid. He was corrupt. So here's what happens. Oak Ames is one of the guys who figured out that the Credit Mobile Air and Union Pacific are the same exact company. And he was bribed. When people found out that Credit Mobile Air and Union Pacific are the same company and that Credit Mobile Air is overbilling the Union Pacific, People just said, that just stinks. That's just the, you know, there's corruption. It's a Gilded Age. Things are corrupt. By the way, when congressmen found out about Oaks Ames, they were like, very bad, Oaks Ames. You're in big trouble. You know what they actually said to him? Why do you steal more? You could have had taken a bigger bribe. You figured this stuff out. The people who ran Union Pacific Railroad are the same people who own Credit Mobile Air. Credit Mobile Air was overbilling themselves and then giving a big fat bill to the federal government. That's the kind of craziness that existed at that time. Also, in the Gilded Age, we, one of the big issues in the Gilded Age, apart from corruption and everything else, was what we should back our currency with. Whether we should back our currency with gold or with silver. Now, the way you look at this, and you can basically start to determine what this term is, is it's called bimetallism. There were actually three kinds of currency. There were, back in the Civil War, greenbacks. There was silver currency. Or there was gold. The silver and gold together are called bimetallism. It's a ratio. Silver is not as valuable as gold. During the Civil War, early, government put out money that was not backed by anything. I know it sounds insane, but you could not redeem it with gold or silver. I'll give you a little example of money today. Technically, the term is fiat. It's a government state, not a car company. It says, I don't have to read it, this, on the dollar bill, every bill, it says this note is equal tender for all debts, public and private. The government said it's money, and you believed it. It's also green. The Civil War era money for the Union was green. It was not backed by anything. My question to you is, why do you think that the government put out greenbacks during the Civil War? Why do you think? Because gold and silver were, certainly gold was in short supply. The government, you say, how did the government get that money into the economy? There's millions of Union soldiers. They're paid every month. They're paid in greenbacks. Greenbacks, because they're not backed. It's basically fiat money. It's not backed by gold. No gold or silver. The government put it out, and let's face it, there was, there was inflation. Prices are rising. One of the big issues that's big in the Gilded Age is inflation. Like when gas prices go up today, that's inflation. Inflation is when prices rise. Let me give you a weird example. Dollars should be sort of rare, like diamonds, right? That's what makes them rare. The expensive is that they're rare. If you were able to print one dollar bill for every oxygen molecule in the planet, money would be almost worthless, right? I mean, 
there'd be a lot of more dollars and people would be like, oh, a billion dollars a year, it doesn't really matter. You might remember um, in the uh, post-World War I Germany, they had massive hyperinflation where prices rose dramatically, like trillions of percent, I mean literally trillions of percent. Um, and the money became sort of worthless. There are people who think that's not so bad. People, so if you want inflation, you want greenbacks. And if you, the government started taking greenbacks out of circulation, because the government's like, people were very critical of putting out this phony money, this funny money, saying it's not real. You only pay us the stuff because the government needed the gold to go fight the war and build cannons to go blow up Germany, you know, blow up Southerners. So greenbacks or silver, because there's tons of silver out there. There's a lot more silver than gold. When a guy gives his wife something silver, that's nice. When a guy gives his girlfriend something gold, that's even nicer, because gold's more valuable than silver. If you were looking at it from this perspective, this is a big issue. The issue is currency. What will be our money supply? And people weren't sure what it should be. People were like, well, maybe we should have inflation. Inflation, basically, is more than deflation. Deflation is when prices drop. Gold, because it's rare, would cause deflation. Prices would actually drop. So a card that's $20,000 this year might be $19,000 next year. Inflation is just the opposite. Inflation would happen from silver or greenbacks. Because greenbacks aren't backed by anything. I mean, technically the government could print up ridiculous quantities of paper cash. It wouldn't be worth much. Somebody would benefit by inflation. You say, who? Farmers. It's a problem. This is true today, too. Farmers produce too much food. In the Gilded Age, they produced way more food than the country could eat. And the problem is, we're not the only ones in the world who produce food. Russia is the biggest wheat producer in the world then. Still a major wheat producer, from what I understand now. The United States is the biggest corn farmer. In the world. Corn is indigenous to the Western Hemisphere, Columbia Exchange, you might remember all that stuff. So here's the deal. If I'm a farmer, farmers overwhelmingly like inflation. They like silver. And if they can't get silver, they like greenbacks. The problem is the government stopped printing greenbacks. Because the government's never liked inflation. The government doesn't want very much social security check to be $1,100 this year and $1,400 next year. The government can't afford that. So the government, generally, the federal government, which is based in Washington, D.C., along the East Coast, never likes inflation. Businesses, uh, businesses generally don't like inflation either because it means their products are going to be worth less. They're going to have to well, actually have to increase the price because money is not worth it as much. I'll tell you something else that may be, be interesting to you. There are, diamonds are nowhere as rare as you think. It's true. If they released all the diamonds they actually have, the price of diamonds would drop dramatically. But the difference is we don't back our currency with diamonds. We back it with gold or silver or some combination of both. So here's the deal. There's a ratio. That's right, math. But you didn't think you'd have to worry about math. 16 ounces of silver to one ounce of gold. Now, when was the big gold strike in America? Pre Civil War. Like the gold rush? Gold rush. Exactly. The country ended up getting a lot of gold. That was good, because we're a growing country, our population is doubling every about 25 years at that time, and we needed a larger money supply. And it was good that we found this gold in California. Well, if you can't get gold, there's a lot more silver than gold. The general's understanding was. 16 ounces of silver would be equivalent to one ounce of gold. That ratio. That is bimetallism. 16 to 1. The problem is, if you look back up there, we have a map. If you're a farmer in Nebraska or Kansas, you are competing against every other 
corn farmer, wheat farmer, whatever kind of farmer you could possibly imagine. The problem is they're producing way more food, and the only way that the farmers can make money is if, if they grow even more food. That is going to be a supply and demand problem. If there's an oversupply of wheat, the price of corn or wheat or whatever is going to drop dramatically because what makes corn supposed to be worth something is it's valuable. The problem is farmers, and this is very true in the Gilded Age, they overproduce. And another thing, farmers are debtors, meaning they borrow money for farm equipment and land and seed and stuff to be farmers out west. You see, the problem is we're along the east coast. We don't like high gas prices. Who doesn't mind high gas prices? Oklahoma and Texas, Alaska likes high gas prices because they make a lot more money. They produce the oil. We don't, New Jersey. Because farmers overproduce, and then today they get government money to not grow as much food as they could. It sounds crazy, but if you had 500 acres, they'd say, grow on 100 acres, we'll send you a check for the rest, and basically don't grow too much, because if you, grow, if you all grew it on all 500 acres, not only would you exhaust the soil, A, but you'd also basically what? What would happen? Well, you basically, uh, the price of the crop would drop so much that every, all the farmers would go out of business. Farmers borrow money from banks. Do banks like inflation or do banks like deflation? Banks hate inflation. So bankers, let's face it, the government's based in the East Coast. Bankers say, we don't want inflation. So we shouldn't actually have any greenbacks anymore. And we shouldn't actually have any silver currency. And there are people who want the gold standard, which is gold's really valuable because there's not a lot of quantity of it in the world and that we should basically have only a gold standard. The people who want farmers, because they're producers, and they're also debtors, let's look at it this way. I'm a farmer. I took a loan out from Ellie's Bank for $1,000 to go out and buy seed and machines and stuff for me to be a corn farmer, right? There's gonna be interest on that $1,000, right? So maybe I pay back $1,100 $50. So here's the deal. The big issue in this era, in the Gilded Age, is that government likes deflation. Still does. They don't like inflation. They don't have to pay more for government stuff. They don't have to pay more for the tank than they, any more than they have to pay. The problem is, people out west definitely want to see big, fat farm prices. The problem is they're producing too much food. They cannot discipline themselves to grow less food because then they'll make less money. The problem is when, the only way a farmer makes more money is if you somehow inflated the currency, which is there's some silver in there, the currency. Bimetallism, put a lot more silver out. Silver or gold, that's bimetallism. The reality is if you supported a gold standard, which is only gold, no silver, you want to have deflation. I'll take this a step further. I borrowed, in my case, $1,000, right? I'm going to pay back $1,150. If there's deflation, like next year, the Cormac Reapers, farming equipment combines, and stuff like that, if there's deflation, there's less dollars going around next year. So this year's dollar is worth more, or less actually, than next year's dollar. So put it this way. I'm, banks make money because they charge interest, right? The principal is $1,000. I'll pay back eleven fifty. If there's deflation, that means they're paying back the bank dollars worth more than they were the previous calendar year. So what? Well, the problem is, the only way to get this to change is if farmers somehow grew less food, which they'll never do. Or if you change the money supply, the currency. The currency issue is the other big issue in the Gilded Age. 
whether we back a currency with gold or silver or just gold, which would be good for people who basically are rich, people like bankers. Farmers, because they produce too much darn corn and wheat and everything else. The reality is we can't eat it all. And Australia and Canada and Russia and other countries produce gigantic quantities of food. So we're not the only guys in the world producing food. And because of shipping and transportation, there are products, there's food from all over the world ending up in the United States, particularly now. If you go to the Route 10, uh, the, 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 the fruit feed market next to Big Lots, most of, the, most of the vegetables and food and stuff is not from America. That's why it's cheap. The corn's mostly from Mexico. Even in the, the wintertime, they still have some corn because Mexico's still warm enough to have corn. The reality is farmers want the government to inflate the currency so that, for example, I'll give you an example. Another example. If I'm a farmer, say I got 45 in this year, so say, and we'll use it back then, in 1880, I got 43 cents a bushel. 1881, if there's deflation, In other words, because the farmers produce too much darn food, it's not so valuable because there's literally states full of food producing areas out west. So they say Nebraska and Kansas are growing massive quantities of corn and wheat and everything else. So, if the price next year of a bushel of whatever I'm producing is 39 cents, I'm down four cents a bushel. See, I made a million bushels. I'm not a lot of money. It gets to be the point next year, 1882, it's down to 34 cents. The only way to save these farmers, because they can't discipline themselves, they're all in competition with one another. The only way to change this would be if you added silver to the economy somehow. If you allowed people to use gigantic quantities of silver. There are, in this era, gigantic strikes of silver all over the West. In fact, we're the Garden State, New York, New Jersey, right? Nevada, that's a silver state. They have lots of quantities of silver out here. So what? Well, the silver producers out here would make a lot of money because the government would basically allow you to coin silver or gold. That's by metallism. People who don't like inflation want to see only the gold standard, because gold's really rare, and they're not finding lot of gigantic quantities of it. The reality is farmers like the idea of finding uh, gigantic quantities of silver, which is, there's gonna, they're gonna find hundreds of tons of silver out west. There's gonna be major silver strikes and gold strikes out west, but mostly more silver. That's why silver is so much cheaper than gold. Because silver is cheaper than gold, it would naturally, if we change the numbers here, Say, let's erase this. If we injected silver into the economy, and the way to do that would be very simple allow people to coin silver. So maybe 1885, if we allowed gigantic quantities of silver, the price of a bushel will now be back to 48 cents. Now you're doing okay and you're gonna be paying back the bank interest on dollars worth less next year. Because dollars in, under deflation become more rare. Farmers produce too much food, they're gonna to have to change the currency to basically be something less worthwhile, like those oxygen molecules that it would actually have a dollar for every oxygen molecule. The idea would be, this would inflate the currency and prices would go up. Who would not like to see inflation? I live in New Jersey. I'm not a farmer. I'm not a producer. Who liked four dollar gasoline? Texas loved four dollar gasoline. Alaska liked four dollar gasoline. I like two fifty gasoline, or two forty. I like that. The reality is, people on the East Coast generally hate inflation because it makes their rent go up and the car and everything else go up. Watch, watch. But isn't like that forty eight cents a lot less than that? 
Boy, I know, but the fact is, I mean, when I was a kid, I'll give you an example of inflation in, in my own lifetime. We used to belong to a pool club down, um, I lived in the Levitt houses. Levitt, Levitt was a great builder, Jewish guy, brilliant guy. Um, at the pool club, a snicker bar was 15 cents and one cent for tax. You can't get a snicker bar for under a dollar today. There's been a lot of inflation since the 1970s when I was a kid. So a snicker bar might be $1.25 now. You're lucky if you get it for a dollar. It was 16 cents when I was a kid. A slice of pizza was 70 cents. It was. It's not anymore. It's like three bucks at least. It'd be more expensive at Jerusalem pizza because it's kosher, right? The fact is, if we change the currency, next year, 1886, maybe it's 51 cents. The farmers are loving it. We're making more money. God, if we didn't have this, we'd be making 34 cents. We'd be out of business. And then eventually it gets to be a point where the farmers would be losing money. They'd be selling it for 34 cents and it costs them 50 cents to make. They'd be out of business. They'd lose money. More inflation. The problem is, remember what I said, though, Ellie? The government hates inflation. They don't want grandma's social security checking and the price of an aircraft carrier to go up so much next year that the government's going to be basically put into a difficult spot. The government and the government people who own and run the government are mostly Easterners, and they do not want to see inflation. They like when I, when I was a kid, not a kid, but 20 years ago, when, you, I, when a nice laptop would be like $2,000. You can get a really good laptop for now five or $600. What, what changed? You tell me. There's more than that. Yeah. More companies build computers. No. Mm -hmm. So Mac, PC. Chromebooks. You get a Chromebook for two fifty. Nobody was paying two fifty for a computer uh, back then because that they were sort of rare. The reality is, there's tons of laptops out there for four, five, six hundred dollars. No one's paying two thousand dollars. And two thousand dollars twenty years ago would be like thirty five hundred dollars today. It just would because of inflation. So when I was a kid, when I was born. Gas was 27 cents a gallon. And then it became 69 cents. And then it became $1.50 in the 1980s. Then it was $4 eight, eight, 10 years ago. That was killing us, right? That's what people like driving SUVs were like, maybe I should get a comedy car, like a Prius. So I'm going to stop here, and we'll basically finish the rest tomorrow. And I think we're good. Any questions other than that? We'll do this again at 10 o'clock tomorrow. I'll see you guys on, on, the, on the Facebook stuff, not Facebook, on the other thing. What do you call it? The, uh, YouTube. YouTube later.